thanks for being back to this our show on ThinkPick Hawaii, uh, a more human, humane built environment. That's what we're addressing here. This is the 303rd show, and you are the accumulated viewer that you see number wise down there. And we're back to the three bald guys from the burning gas station with uh, you, Matt, after having been in. Italy, uh, and you've been in uh, Germany, and you have been in New York, and now you're back in your uh, Boston Danish booster uh, box office mm -hmm. there. And mm -hmm. thank you for seeing a fan, a ceiling fan up there. Welcome back, <laughs> Matt. Thank you. And it's you, DeSoto, and me, Martin. Uh, you in almost, and I am at the foothills of our Leahi Diamond Head volcano. Yes, so, we are <laughs> and you are in your lush, exotic, tropical Asipov designed home. You, so you have the most desirable uh, location there with your doggy back there and the birds that we see who are cheerleading us here. And Matt and me for different reasons, but more indoors. I have a fan here running too, and you have one up there. So let's get the first slide up because we're reflecting on uh, Lahaina again. Uh, we're picking up from where we were. And a couple of uh, additions to um, the last slide that we see show quoted at the top left here. By the way, um, to get our memory back to Soto, the guy who did the steel tube furniture, his name was Walter Lamb. Walter I Lamb, that's right. that's right. I looked up the show. His place is on the way to uh, Hawaii Kai and uh, almost at the end of the highway going there on the uh, Makai side. They're easy to recognize because the fish pond people who are just behind it painted the wall kind of bluish and fish pondy with fish somewhere. So when you yes. drive by, that's where the place is. And in, 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 in both cases, you know, it's um, I, and I was looking up the, the Hardoi chair Ironically or telepathically or intuitively, I got an, an email from a, uh, the equivalent to your gift shop, uh, the Soto in your Bishop Museum, what the Dessau uh, Bauhaus Museum has a gift shop. And what they had as their item of the week was, guess what, the Hardoi chair. And the ones on sale were like a thousand bucks. So I think we can say this is where the Bauhaus, I mean, I don't, I, I throw this out, tra tragically failed and trying to do something for the people that's affordable and has, you know, a decent approach and it ended up being exclusive and now, you know, out of the, out of reach for the masses. And this is certainly something, here comes the metaphor. This is what you want for Lahaina because we're still hitting even the national news here, the New York Times after the Maui fire, locals fear being shut out of recovery. And the other thing I want to say is about credibility, because you guys might think by now, well, who are these three kind of howly looking guys talking about us in Lahaina? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking on, you know, maybe myself, I start out first. I used to live on 1200 plus square feet owned, but for a while not anymore, I downsized as I call it to 200 plus. Uh, rented here in the Waikiki Grand. And over the summer, which I yet have to report, I downsized to a quarter of that, of a little more than half of 100, like 60 something on two wheels. So, um, and you know, the 200 square feet we even tested out as you just had your family with you, uh, Matt, a uh, little while ago, and you just sort of hosted them in the Bishop Museum. Um, we even tried the four of us on 200 square feet. and. Rightly so, it taught me a lot, mainly about uh, the um, the adolescent, uh, you know, adult craving, uh, you know, scenario or challenge, which uh, also has to do with our Western mindset of thinking we have to kind of own things and we have to have bedrooms and, and rooms for ourselves. And we have seen your, uh, uh, Matt, your, uh, your in-law's house in, in Kailua, which unfortunately now through gentrification, it is likely a million dollar home, but it wasn't mm -hmm. like that to begin with. It was a very humble kind of American dream. You know, everyone deserves a house, a simple house that um, mm -hmm. is also fairly down to earth. And you just sort of, if I may, and you jump in if I 
go the wrong angle. But uh, as we hear, your family, and especially your father, was very commercially successful. And uh, you decided to not go into his footsteps and uh, decided to stay on the cultural side. And basically, you know, don't try to, you know, be more uh, famous as far as effluent, but, you know, dedicate yourself to your culture versus the, the commercial part of it, right? And I want to also include now here the show quote at the top right. In the show quote at the top left is our friend Ron Lindgren. I'm so happy he has responded to us via email because we were worried because we haven't heard from him for too long. Thanks, Ron, for giving us that notice of that you're still uh, with us and, uh, and hanging in there. And Ron, you also, I just came from my morning Holly Kolani and I looked up the Flux magazine article that says the art of the first encounterment or something like that. So it's about the Valet people. And we had the discussion that Ron was also, you have to be profitable, Matt, as an office to keep doing what you do. But I would say you guys do it not for profit primarily. And the Killingsworth office, uh, they didn't even set up shop here or they didn't uh, get seduced to own a piece of your rock, DeSoto. They came here, blessed us with the best what they could, and they went away again. If they were wanted again, they came. And he lives very humbly in his you know, half a million dollar home, which is rather cheap in California. And he is, uh, you quote on you, Ron, uh, you're a house rich, but money poor. And hopefully you can change that and, and you know, your, your neighbor buys it and allows you to, you know, stay living there for the rest of your life. But you can also visit us again. So I think, you know, everything that being said, where we come from literally and figuratively, uh, you know, uh, gravitates around that beast of greediness and of capitalism. Because that's where the fears basically circle around, right? The soda. And we you had responded to what I was finding in the news that some people, most absurd, are still burdened with mortgage rates for their houses that aren't anymore. I mean, how absurd, what an absurd beast is that, you know, uh, principle of capitalism that, yes, we haven't found a better one yet, at least not in practice. But it is really absurd. So all that being said, um, you guys chip in. But I wanted to, it made me all think about, it came to my mind. I was thinking about, is there any example that I remember of something that was created, not with greediness in mind, but with collectiveness in mind? And that brought back Arco Santi by Paolo Soleri from the 70s. So what are your thoughts and memories of that in regards to Lahaina? I want to open this discussion. Uh, no, it's an interesting um, corollary to make simply because it is it was a, in a sense, a kind of collective or kind of almost commune kind of environment where people came there out of a desire to sort of um, cohabitate and uh, kind of work together, making things, building things, uh, creating art also. Um, and it's a very almost innocent uh, kind of notion of community that I think they established there. It's actually almost ironic that you put this up because just a couple of weeks ago, my wife and I um, bought one of the bells that they still produce, uh, which are very nice um, and, and still in production at, at Arco Santi. And you can, you can order them and we have one hanging on our roof deck in Boston right now, but um quite an interesting experiment in a different way of living than any of us have uh, attempted. Yeah, and myself, I had to refresh my memories because the small little show quote in the center there, I only saw it once some uh, 40 years ago almost when I was in my <clears throat> making my childhood uh, Landjacht Straßenkorte dreams come true in my 72 Plymouth Fury for 600 bucks. I drove there. And I happened to see Soleri walking across the courtyard with his swim trunks on and going to the go, going to the pool. And um, yes, the uh, the brass bell, you know, um, cast production is the only sort of business they do. But it was almost supplementary, right? They mm -hmm. they came there all together and they actually did workshops over the years over the decades where they 
who was interested. I mean, it was basically, you know, um, designed for 5,000 people, but I think only a fraction, like 50 actually live there. But whoever wanted to come, they gave them sort of an, um, a briefing and an introduction and a training for basically self, uh, continue to self build and do it from scratch, from dirt in this case, this is in the desert. And so they basically did that. And their kind of wind chimes was, was not really, they didn't rely on you know, doing that, but it was more like, okay, this is a little thing on the side because as mm -hmm. here from, from Wikipedia or actually from their website, not from Wikipedia, it's urban laboratory focused on innovative design, community and environmental accountability. So how does that sound? It just came back to my mind that I thought this is actually something interesting that if a community comes together and says, we do something for us and we do it ourselves. And if then people come and want to join, they're welcome, but we don't rely existentially on them. I have to also mm -hmm. add about the hospitality while again, thanks Ron having designed the Holly Kalani in a way that one of the valet people goes to see his daughter which is a bittersweet thing because she lives on the ninth island in Vegas because she can't afford to be here anymore. But her dad can't afford to still be here because he gets decently paid in the Holly Kolani. My Waikiki grant isn't so grand because the Filipino people I said, Ray, are Ray of all trades. You know, I see him having some time off, but the sweet maids, the ladies here to make the hotel beds. They always have a smile on their face and they're the sweetest. But when I ask them how they are beyond their smile, I see them being totally exhausted. And they, I asked them, do you ever have off? And they said, no, we work seven days a week. And then they say, we're happy to have a job. We're happy to have the money. But what kind of life is that? That's kind of plantation slavery, right? In, in a different way. And so if, if you can create a community that doesn't, is not based on the slavery of capitalism, but on some kind of, and yes, it was a sort of silly, you know, naive, romantic commune, you know, idea, but in some sense, you know, it, it has worked out. And architecturally also something uh, in many ways you can actually say, we said this before, but reiterate it again. It seems like while, uh, you know, um, the desert in Arizona is climatically a desert, but architecturally it seems an oasis. While we sometimes, and that we say this for the next slide, so keep it with that, that also has to do with evolution. Because um, over there, it was Frank Lloyd Wright who set shop there with his Telecine West. Mm -hmm. And so Larry was actually, you know, with him and then split off. And when we had, this is the show quote at the very bottom there, when we had Will Bruder here, Will was part of Solari and then started to be on his own. And then the next, well, there's a new generation now, but Rick Joy, Wendell Burnett, and all the other ones came out of Wills. So there is this evolution of tradition. And here, uh, DeSoto, we bring in you and we bring in you, uh, you in again. It seems like when statehood that you, you know, embraced it positively, but it seems that for the Hawaii architectural generation, it was almost overwhelming. And we didn't give them any time to catch up from the, from the thatch hut to the multi-story high rise. And, you know, the other guys stepped in as your architect, Asipov being genetically Russian, grew up in Japan. You had the Howleys, Pete Wimberly, uh, you know, or uh, Edwin Bauer. Uh, you had Alfred Price from Austria, and you had Takashi Anbi from Japan. They stepped in, and rightly so. They basically said, "Oh, well, it was mid-century, so we already do the best, but we do it better here because this is a more beautiful place." That was basically the the attitude, right? Which, um, again, next slide, maybe jump to the next slide. Um, in some way, it almost seems while we're climatically paradise, but architecturally, we seem to be a desert because that tradition of these pioneers, of these heyday pioneers, as we see depicted here fairly <laughs> well, when I was on the way to the health center last week, because I picked up COVID again, um, 
I saw this one here, and I thought the combination of the Hale Moana Manoa, not Moana Manoa, by uh, uh, I am Pay and your previous car, the VW Bug, is a perfect depiction of the exotic. You know, you getting an architect who is Chinese American and cars from Germany. You adopted them well because they were embracing pretty much your culture. While unfortunately, the, the image to the left of it is what we have right now, where we have these invasive hermetic high rises mm -hmm. alluding to the uh, mobile and the immobilia, which is the French um, German uh, way of calling real estate. You basically have uh, this situation that you hermeticize stacklinize as Kurt calls it, because behind that is basically stacked floors that keep you cool, keep you dry primarily, but you throw this movie over. And from our, you know, you see the end of the 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 windshield of the open easy breezy PI mobile, but the cars in front you see is a Mustang primarily convertible and you see a Jeep Wrangler primarily the car that we need you, Ron, to come back when we reconvene the cars and the, the architecture show and you share with us your crazy story of you having been flying in what the Wrangler used to be, which was the Willys Jeep, right? The all open Jeep. So this is absurd. Now these two cars, the Mustang convertible is the epitome of freedom, right? Cruising through with a convertible open and that this is the open willies jeep and all of a sudden they have basically morphed into these convenient commodified enclosed convertibles so you mm. you guys get pretty much the metaphor and even more ironically what this building here replaced is one of our favorites of similar to arco sunday i think uh, thinking about it again the soda don't you think that ward warehouse by our Dear Steve Al was like the Arco Santi of Kakaako and of Hawaii. Yeah, and it's from the same time period. So what we were just discussing about sort of a communal type of living is very much something that was going on in the 1960s and 70s. And I apologize, there is a loud machine going in the background, so I'll talk loud. There was this feeling of the changing going on in society at that time, and people were trying to break away from capitalist uh, accumulative lifestyle that was very so much uh, a part of the United States as well as many other places. And so they were experimenting with this, we won't have private property, we will try to live more communally. Well, the Ward Warehouse was not literally a commune, but it was from that same time period, and it did aesthetically try to embrace some of the same concepts of uh, natural services, surfaces. So there was, it was wood and bare metal, and the wood was unpainted, and they didn't try to cover up all of the machinery. They made it right out there in front so that they were being honest about it. They weren't trying to gloss it over, or cover it up. And it was a more, I, I'd say it was more true to what the materials were that it was made from. And again, the lack of ornamentation and the lack of pretension and the lack of covering up or decorating, but just to make it more honest. And that is an advantage economically when you're building it and designing it, as well as making a statement that was trendy at the time. And of course, many of the um, many of the original tenants tended to be more artistic. They tended to be more creative. They tended to be places where people were selling creatively handmade things. So I'd say that yes, there was a parallel there. How does that go along with what we're looking towards the future of Lahaina? Obviously, it's going to be something that people in Lahaina have to come up with not only what they want to do but what they're willing to do and what they can afford to do. And again, we have to be aware that in Lahaina, we are dealing with many pieces of privately owned property. We're not going to be able to start from scratch with a commune because everybody already has his or her little piece of land. And they have to consider not only what they want, but can there be agreed upon 
standards that everybody will rebuild to, which will take care of things like not only the need to have places to sell things and the places to live in, but also to not have them burn down again so that what, what, it, what they're built of is not as flammable and also hopefully to be less carbon intensive so that people aren't using as much air conditioning and how can we avoid that by building better and smarter and also what's affordable when people are all going to be dealing with independently trying to get money from their insurance companies and this is going back to what you just said uh martin of of the lenders of people's homes and properties still demanding their mortgage payments for buildings that no longer exist, which is insane. Um, how much money is going to go to the mortgage holder and how much is going to be left to the homeowner to rebuild with? So it has to be, there have to be, there has to be creative thought going into this. And hopefully again, people will break away a little bit from what they expect and what they already had to be taking into consideration living smarter, living less expensively, living non-flammably, and being someplace that also economically works, where if tourism is the lifeblood of the community, how do you deal with all the tourists who want to come there who are going to pay you money to be able for you to live and get a wage? All of those things are going on, and there are lots and lots of other questions as well. So I'm kind of diverging here, but again, the whole point is to think creatively and think differently in as this project goes forward, being aware of how many people have suffered emotionally, have been through the trauma too, that we have to be thoughtful about how they feel, those most directly impacted, as this project goes forward, as the whole situation goes forward. Yeah, and expanding on that, get the next, get to the next slide, please. Here, again, World Warehouse is is a you know good example because it is a it is a for profit project, right? It was a, a strip mall. I mean, that's like the you know, it was it was a row of shops, but as you said, the Soto, it was shops for local businesses, the mom and pop owner operated. And it was, you know, buying, you know, things, uh, you know, for little money versus all the malls we have, uh, Alamana, we always had, but also international marketplace morphed into that. You did a great show about what it was, and now we all know what it is right now. So where, warehouse was that where little people could buy little things from little people. So um, where is that? And this year is interesting because, you know, Steve is not with us anymore, uh, you know, but um, he lives on. And what Warehog greatly lives on, uh, not just through here, we see um, Sammy uh, here, uh, basically with Sela, they wanted to go to Patagonia. And Patagonia basically had reclaimed what you see in the back, our logs from Ward Warehouse and our dear friend Bundit says he's going to get us pictures from where someone he knows got some logs and he makes sticky, uh, you know, uh, structures uh, out of it. There are somewhere for you. You uh, got us updated on your recent new picky bar in Boston. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's one, I think, in Michigan somewhere where basically Bundet said that's where they have their afterlife. And and this is because they're a solid timber. And you met and we as Despeng Architect have both been building solid timber buildings that passed, you know, pretty strict fire code, you know, okay. requirements. And it's possible because solid timber is different than light timber, that light frame timber. So we want to basically look into this. So I think that we got to ask the new generation of here, basically, you know, Semi being one and a half decades young, and then we have Joey being three decades young, and he currently is with IKEA. And IKEA and Patagonia, yes, they have to make a profit to keep their business running, but they're not stock market obsessed and registered. In fact, both their owners decided not to do that in intentionally. So there's maybe not an altruist attitude there, but certainly some kind of philanthropist idea that drives it. So we also want to encourage that because 
when you hear about insurance companies and banks, it, it's all about the greediness. So why can't there be something like this along these lines? And we only have two minutes left, so we want to uh, tell you what's going to be next. Very spontaneously talking credibility, you, the audience, might also say, hey, guys, do you even know what you're talking about? Because have you even been there? Yes, now we have, thanks to you, DeSoto. You went last week to see an eyewitness what's going on there. So we decided spontaneously with you, Jay, uh, and you, DeSoto, uh, doing that next week together and giving footage, giving us an impression with you, Matt, and I stepping back. And then we stepped back in basically the week after that I will then throw in a, because there's currently this in limbo Okay, what do we do, right? We we um, we don't have time. We don't want to think about rebuilding so soon and so fast, and everything is confused uh, because it's so complex from these different angles. On the other side, we get news about people get kicked out of the hotels. People, you know, are afraid. Can they even stay? Do they have to go on the Nines Island and do what our belay friend's, you know, daughter has to do? So for that, we wanna we talked about we had Martin, the other Martin. He's from Colombia, the country of Colombia, a fellow tropical climate. And he stepped in and did a very sort of quick uh, proposal for what if could be as a suggestive proposition. So we want to share these two things. So selecting a couple of the images that captured us uh, our attention the most from what you will share next week, the Soto, and then also from Martin. So that being said, we have a minute minute left. You guys, have any your no remaining thoughts? Maybe Matt, we didn't let you talk too much. Uh, <laughs> now we put you on the spot. Uh, I know. I mean, I I think uh, probably we ought to. Do, we just want to end. You know, con continuing to express our concern and and thoughts with uh, with with the people of Lahaina, and um, that's always at the forefront of of uh, our discussions here, um, despite the fact that they might meander off into into our uh, professional and personal obsessions about things. Um, at the end of the day, it really is about, you know, the people there and what's best for, for the community. So um, yeah, maybe that's and, the, the way to end. You know, thank you. That That is, and with us getting personal is just saying we care and we want you, the audience, where do you come from? Where is your heart and how can you, versus jumping on sort of often too surfacial solutions, having basically substantial suggestions. And that's what we encourage us all to do. Okay, that is it. The Soto, much looking forward on your impressions uh, from having gone there for us and for all of us next week. Thanks for that. Looking forward to. Bye-bye.